Welcome back to NPTEL, the National Program on Technology Enhanced Learning. We are in a series of lectures under the larger rubric of English language and literature. We are as you know in module 1 of um, uh, 5 modules that are there in our course and we have already dealt with a few lectures on um, various you know we talked about the scope of English studies for instance. Okay. And today's lecture is entitled International English and uh, before you know as always before we move on to um, what we are going to talk about that is international English. Let us look at what we did in our last lecture. Now, by way of recap, we look at the idea of alchemy. <coughs> okay, if you remember the, uh, the last lecture was on the alchemy of English and we understand alchemy as transmutation. It was an uh, attempt as you know by earlier uh, you know <coughs> people who who uh, sort of dabbled with if I may use the word uh, in, in alchemy uh, with a view with a goal which never came about that was for of uh, turning base metals to gold. Okay. Alchemy also means by extension wisdom it is also called the search for the philosopher's stone that is ultimate wisdom and the secret to longevity. And he found that Braj Kachru in um, his work entitled alchemy the alchemy of English, he likens English to alchemy at least as English has alchemic, okay, alchemic uh, properties of being able to change things in a good way. Okay. So, there are you know there are ways in which English is, is talked about um, uh, you know the spread of English is talked about in a derogatory sense as, as <coughs> overshadowing vernacular languages, but Kachru we saw uh, pointed to the transformative or transmutative if you will qualities of English particularly with, with uh, you know uh, with rela uh, in relation to you know issues of caste for instance. So, we do not have words differentiating uh, um, you know people on the basis of social or class structures uh, whereas, uh, in Indian languages these these markers okay, these verbal markers of caste may be very very pronounced. Okay. So, we also found that English is manipulable and it is manipulated also the other side of the picture it is manipulated as a medium of power. Okay. It is a medium of control, authority and uh, you know suppose cohesion of society. Okay. Now, again quickly reading from what we saw last time the English language has in acquired important roles both internationally and internationally. These roles are in the hands of a small section of the total population, but this power oppresses the lot if this power is wielded. Now, this is important this is the caveat we get from Baj, uh, from Braj Kachru in his lecture. Okay. So, they, it may be that only a few uh, you know compared to the entire population say in India that English is uh, um, a tool that is in the hands of a very few. Okay. Uh, or a very small percentage of the population compared to the rest of India. And he gives us this warning that if it is not, uh, it, if this tool is not used with sensi sensitivity, with responsibility and understanding, then as he said it will become uh, not something that is alchemic or uh, trans, you know has great transformative, positive transformative power, but is uh, something that becomes a tool of oppression. Okay. Then he says the alchemy of English then does not only provide social status, it also gives access to attitudinally and materially uh, desirable material desirable domains of power and knowledge. Okay. This is what we found in the last lecture. It provides a powerful linguistic tool for manipulation and control. In addition, this alchemy of English has left a deep mark on the languages and literature of the non-western world. English has thus caused transmutation of languages equipping them in the process of as it says new societal scientific and technological demand. So, this is really the Yanner's face or the double face of English and its trans transmutative powers that we saw in our last lecture. Then 
there was uh, you know we we looked at what attitudinality and neutral uh, the attitudinal neutrality and power meant for instance we found that in code uh, when you use code mixing when we use two languages okay bilingual co code mixing in our conversation it helps to neutralize identities in native language that are there in native languages and dialects okay and we also found that this neutralization can be used really as a linguistic uh, strategy Oh, this this part of alchemy of English is related to from here we move on to international English. You remember that he has uh, Professor Crutchu made this very why not it is a very famous is a standard way of looking at uh, uh, you know the spread of English and the use of English in different parts of the world. Uh, it is not that it is uh, that it has not been contested by other scholars and linguists. <laughs> However, at this elementary level it is however at this elementary level this is what uh, we can stay with okay so he says that there is an inner circle of english of uh, the english speaking population okay and this circle is norm providing it provides the norm normative ways in which english has to be spoken in, in which english has to be uh, words have to be pronounced in which the grammar has to be um, uh, to be used okay. and within this inner circle is obviously the United Kingdom from where we had the language, Ireland, the United States, New Zealand, South Africa and Canada these form the core. right? So, this uh, is as you saw the first circle or the inner core circle okay, of English using nations. Then he talks about the outer circle which is called not normative, but norm developing. These are countries like India, Pakistan and the Philippines. Now, he says <coughs> these are countries where English has had a historical importance. For example, the, these are the erstwhile colonies of the British empire. Okay. So, here we find that these countries are ones that develop the norm that have been set up. It may not, ha may not be that today, but in the times in colonial times these were the countries where the norms uh, were also being developed. At the outermost ring we have the expanding circle which is norm dependent. right? So, they are China for instance, Russia, Egypt, Japan and Europe. So, this form the, forms the expanding circle and as more and more countries begin to have um, a considerable number of speakers. Okay, in the English language, uh, this expanding circle will accommodate those countries. Then <coughs> the other important markers of the power of English as Kachu has said and for which also leads us to the question of international English is its uh, sheer demographic distribution over the world. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, it is used in important world fora. Uh, its native and non-native users across different cultures and of course, it is uh, considerably rich literary tradition that many are you know many are acquainted with. Uh, consider the number of English language and literature departments that are there in countries other <coughs> sorry other than England okay? and you will be able to get a, get a grasp of um, how the rich literary tradition of England is uh, something that is studied in so many different countries. So, when we come to international English, um, we can look at it as an as somebody has said an, an attempt and establishing an international standard. This is very important. It is an attempt at establishing an international <coughs> excuse me standard for the use of the English language. One of the most important reasons is that many speakers of the language today are from countries, this is important, are from countries and regions where English is not the native language. This is something which we discuss also in our introductory lecture and yet English is increasingly becoming the lingua franca or the world language, the lingua franca or the common means of communication of the world especially in which categories in business communication, internet communication and academics. Now, this itself is enough for us to enough for those rally for international English okay, 
to make their point that English is used in <coughs> in uh, you know in 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 world business fora <coughs> sorry uh, in academics consider the very many conferences okay to which there are uh, people from all over the world okay presenting their findings their papers so there has to be a certain standard uh, standardized form of english which they want to call international english okay also for internet communication so this has made it um almost an imperative and there has been you know uh, there has been a number of um, number of attempts at formulating international an international standard for the use of the English language. Now, let us look at the definition this definition uh, I have taken from the handbook of world Englishes edited by Braj Kachru in which Robert D. King describes the English language in the following way. Now, he says that this he calls this language this supple economic subtle instrument of communication. Okay? It is a communication of uh, you know to do with commerce, uh, you know to do with literature and that has become de facto and in many institution, uh, institutions and contexts the de jure uh, language or the lingua franca of the world. So, there are many scholars in fact, who, who have reiterated the importance of English from its point of view of usage and its for, you know as an uh, it's used in economics uh, in uh, you know in economic sorry economic transactions in use as we saw in the internet uh, in, as an instrument of communication all over the world and uh, it is not that it is just a de facto you know that, that the de facto instrument in many countries it has become de jure or de jure which means that it is actually by law okay that this language is to be used Therefore, English as an international language has an acronym and the acronym is EIL and as we know an international standard is sought to be set okay, as a global means of communication. This essentially is what differentiates international English from uh, world Englishes. Okay. In world Englishes you will find that there is a celebration of the varieties of English. Okay. There is a um, uh, an insistence so to speak there is a recognition of uh, you know there is a recognition of the resistance to a standardized use of English. Uh, there are questions of culture, there are questions of ideology inherent in world uh, world Englishes. However, by contrast we find here this more for you know pragmatic uh, you know sort of um, what should I say transactory if I may use the word transactory concerns that the need for an uh, standard international English is sought. Now, having said that uh, the picture is not really a happy one, it is not that we do really you understand have uh, do really have an international English as yet, but there have been a number of attempts that have been there in uh, that have been made in trying to make uh, you know an international variant of English. So, uh, what are the other ways in which scholars have you know um, in which scholars have tried to name uh, uh, this endeavor right there it is not that it is known only as um, international English. We also have a term ELF that is English as a lingua franca another term for it going by the commonality uh, issue is common English then continental English basic English and global English. So, these are the various terminologies okay, that is given to international English and um, if you go by these terms you also understand where the particular thrust lies for instance basic English. In many institutions in India you will find that there is a course on basic English. Okay. So, to understand you know what, what is that course going to do that course is not going to talk about the variations of English it is going to give you as far as possible the normative way in which you have to uh, learn English. For instance, in, in, in IITs, in engineering colleges, um, you often find such a course. Okay. This is to enable uh, you know, uh, the people who are going to be engineers and scientists to be able to use the language in such a way that, that they can make themselves intelligible okay, to a world audience. Do you understand? Okay. So, these are some of the various terms English ELF English as a lingua franca, common English, 
basic English, global English, continental English, these are the terms with their specific so to speak a uh, specific agendas uh, uh, in trying to carve out okay carve out a standard sort of english now i will what i'll do in the rest of the essay is see by now you know it's very simple you know that english, international english is an attempt made by several scholars and linguists to devise a particular kind of english now i'll like to bring bring to you what some scholars have said in the rest of the essay about international English and the in a way nuances and problematics of international English. Now, let us look at um, an essay um, I think it was published in the journal English today if I am not mistaken by Elizabeth Erling and the title of the essay is the many names of English. Okay, let us read what she says. E I L or English as an international language has been used in a range of ways. Now, she points to a well known linguist named Widdersen. Okay. Widdersen for example, employs it to describe the specific use of English for international, professional and academic purposes, which is mostly carried out in the written language. So, look at let us look at this specific use of English for international, professional and academic purposes which is mostly carried out in the written language. He argues that English as an international language should be treated as a register of English that is a what a register is a particular repertoire of words. Okay? So, it should be considered a register of English as most of the people learning it only need access to certain look at this certain occupational or functional domains. This is something that I had mentioned ago the functionalist approach of uh, the pragmatic approach of international English. So, this is only only so that they can have access to, to you know on occupational fronts on functional fronts okay, and do not use it as a community or national language. So, it also implies that well you may speak your English your world English your variant of world English, but at the same time as Widdersen says you need to be competent. Okay, as a person who is will be talking at an international level, you need to be competent at a certain standardized way of speaking English, however basic and however geared towards occupational uh, interests and goals. It is not that there is obviously uh, that there is no politics uh, involved here, but what Widdersen says is that a certain level of competence is necessary for instance, if you are an engineer or even an academician or a policy maker okay, so that you can make yourself intelligible. This is a standard way of looking at international English. Then Erling points out that Widdersen further argues that in, uh, English as an international language is a composite lingua franca which is this is important free of any specific allegiance to any primary variety of the English of English sorry of the language. So, it need not be the Anglo American variety. Okay. So, it may be quite a discrete uh, uh, you know collection of norms okay, which have been devised uh, for people in uh, uh, you know in various occupations to be able to present themselves in the language in an international setup. Now, one of the most well known scholars if I may point to her. Um, in this domain is Barbara Seidhofer. Okay. So, Barbara Seidhofer has made several contributions to this issue of um, you know um, uh, international English and I point to her work a concept of international English and related issues. This, this is particularly to do with the European context, but let us look at what she has to say about the issues of international English. Obviously, the various additions to English in all of the above terms serve to indicate that is above terms are the different different terms that we saw a while ago. Okay. Obviously, the various additions to English in all of the above terms serve to indicate that something is in operation here that requires what she says the signaling of a difference. Okay. The signaling of a difference from the default conception of a language, namely the code and conventions employed by its native speakers. This is what we discussed a while ago. These terms, as the different terms used for international English, variously emphasize what are perceived as relative aspects of the use of English in different contexts for different purposes, 
but what they this is important what they have in common is that they signal some sort of recognition okay this is the word some sort of recognition that in the use of english as an international language conditions hold which are different from situations when a language is clearly associated with its native speakers and its place of origin this is a very important point here okay that the all these different terminologies may be there like uh, common english for instance or basic english but there is she says there is all what these have in common is there an uh, you know uh, an acceptance of the fact or a recognition of the fact as it uses the word recognition here that in the use of in the, in the specific use of english as an international language there are certain conditions okay which are different as she says which are different from the situations when a language is clearly associated with the native speakers and its place of origin whether it is spoken by those native speakers or by people who have learnt it as a foreign language different attitudes and expectations as she said should prevail and different different norms should apply okay so this is again both a recognition of the fact that there is a commonality being sought but at the same time okay is also uh, also implied here that there are differences there are different norms and expectations that all always will be there okay so these are some of the issues in international english the slide here shows again which we mentioned a while ago that while world english focuses on the variety insists on the variety of english and uses the word englishes international english is an attempt at what we call a non localized english and an attempt at bringing Uh, you know a kind of english which uh, um, will be adopted by everyone particularly as we saw uh, 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 a while ago in matters of world fora of you know of occupational uh, occupational issues so when it comes to international english from pedagogical point of view okay so that's another um, aspect that has been dealt with by many which is the teaching of international english okay so the teaching of intellect, uh, international english may be uh, in general or in a broad way described as the linguistic tools okay that we will build or we our people have sought to build for as we know, as as we found international or even intercultural communication so what kinds of linguistic language tools as far as english is concerned are you going to build for international communication now again seidhofer says in the same work english is used by plurilingual and monolingual people alike but obviously due to the numerical pre predominance of non native speakers the plurilinguals outnumber the monolinguals and she finds that it is the non native speakers of english she points to the future you know she says it is the non native speakers of english who will be the main agents in the ways english is used okay is maintained and changes and who will shape the ideologies and beliefs associated with it so it is not uh, you know uh, it's not that we should be alarmed that there is again you know uh, you know a hegemonic sort of um, uh, you know or a, a, a hegemonic sort of um, orientation in trying to build international english she says on the other hand in points as she mentions here the plurilingual and monolingual people okay she says that it is in future the non natives who are going to devise this sort of an international english okay and will decide right will decide the ideologies and beliefs that are associated with that kind of language uh, uh, so, sorry that kind of english so it is left to us to look at the brighter side of it as not really another uh, you know um another colonialist or a neo colonialist imposition of the english language it is the non native speaker who is going to perhaps contribute more to devising that language now let's look at uh, s meke again we are talking about the teaching of uh, english as an international national language and even in the case of barbara seidhofer as we found a while ago even in the teaching of english as an international language uh, the the non native okay the non native plurilingual teacher uh, is also going to be an important component in devising such uh, uh, such a language okay so s m k says international english is used by native speakers of english and bilingual bilingual users of english for cross cultural communication 
International English can be used, as he mentions here, both in a local sense between speakers of diverse cultures and languages within one community and in a global sense between speakers from different countries. Now, here we find another angle to, to it. All this while we have been saying that international English is going uh, uh, is uh, uh, you know uh, is an attempt to formulate device and English which is going to be used in inter international fora okay, for international global communication. But Meke says here that that need not be the case right. Here that international or basic or common English will also be used as I said here can be used also in a local sense between speakers of diverse cultures and languages within a country. Take a country like India for instance okay, with, with uh, so many hundreds of languages okay. um, and um, you know uh, how English is spoken, pronounced, how it is written in different parts of the country. So, it is not that you know uh, Meke enlarges the concept of international English um, in saying that it is also English used intra not internationally, but intranationally within a country where there are diverse cultures and languages. So, there also we have a basic English okay, or an uh, international English that will be the lingua franca of that particular country. An English that is you know which has its own norms and which has its own repertoire of words and its own, own uh, grammatical rules. Find then we find another in another essay um, entitled English in the Future by D. Gradol and let's, let us read from here. The widespread use of English as a language of wider communication will continue to exert pressure towards as it says this is the word he uses global uniformity as well as give rise to anxieties about declining standards, language change and the loss of geolinguistic diversity. This is something that is anyway going to be there and this is a point highlighted in this essay by Gradol. That is on the one hand, you know there are these contrary contradictory pulls. On the one hand, uh, because of the increasing use of English okay, as a language of wider communication across nations, okay, there will always be this pressure as it says a pressure, a, 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 a pressure for global uniform uniformity in the use of the language. Okay. But a tendon as it happens in, in, in many cases in cultural phenomena, okay, so also in language, there are attendant opposite problems here as that there as it says it is going to be the rise in anxieties about declining standards, language change and most importantly what was celebrated in world English is the loss of geo, uh, geolinguistic diversity. Okay. So, it is almost like uh, you know losing languages. So, here we have world Englishes okay, and, and variety as the moment we come into a global uniformed uh, 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 sorry un, uh, 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 way or standardized way of doing English, it will almost so to speak may result in a sort of language death. Okay. A variety of English in a country is a language. Okay. So, it result in as he says uh, very aptly here the loss of geolinguistic diversity. Then he goes on to say, but as English shifts from foreign language to second language status for an increasing number of people, we can also expect to see English develop a larger number of local varieties. Okay. This is the point that we will take up further in uh, the lecture on world Englishes. Now, we know that that Gradol has raised this question of contradiction, okay, the contradictory pulls. He further goes on to say, these contradictory tensions arise because English has two main functions in the world. This is very important. Okay. Why should we have these contradictory pulls? The, he says that English has two main functions in this world. It provides a vehicular language, a carrying language. Okay, language. Okay, it provides a vehicular language. Is a, I think it's a phrase you found also in um, uh, in alchemy of uh, you know uh, in alchemy of English in the last lecture. So it provides 
is using the same term here a vehicular language for international communication and it forms the basic basis for interestingly also constructing cultural identities. So, these are the two this is the paradox of English ok. It is, um, it is uh, uh, you know supposed to be a lingua franca, it is supposed to be a vehicle for you know for um, uh, you know um, furthering of one's uh, uh, socio economic status in many many situations. It is a tool for international communication, but also it forms the basis basis for constructing and expressing and manifesting our cultural identities. Okay. The former function requires what? It requires mutual intelligibility. This is what is okay, mutual that we understand one another in a language and certain common standards obviously. Now, the latter which is the construction of cultural identities, the latter encourages the development of what? Of local forms okay, and hybrid varieties and this is bound to happen when, when uh, particularly in you know a very strongly in countries with a, with a long colonial history uh, uh, you know of British domination right. But also as I said even in the expanding circles it is not only in you know the, <coughs> the outer circle of you know mentioned by Braj Kachu that is going to happen, but also in expanding circles in, in, in countries where uh, you know that were not necessarily dominated at some point of in the historical time by a colonial uh, uh, you know past involving the British. So, the latter encourages uh, that is of cultural identity encourages the development of local forms and varieties of English and hybrid varieties of English. For instance, Hinglish you, know, you may have come across the term Hinglish that is a mixture of Hindi and English. Okay. Hinglish is uh, many think is going to take over English as we know it in India ok and at least in some parts of India that now you have papers and books written on English ok. So, these are high that is a hybrid variety that um, Gradol is talking about ok. So, as English plays an ever more important role in the first of these functions it simultaneously look at this simultaneously finds itself acting as a language of identity for larger numbers of people around the world and really in the end it, there is no paradox here ok. Uh, as you know even cries for linguistic difference uh, are articulated you know one side of the stories are articulated in the English language do you understand. So, this is uh, you cannot do without that language, the language that brings uniformity and togetherness also helps you ok, also helps you realize also helps you uh, you know to insist on resistance and that is the power and also as we found in the last lecture, this last lecture is really also related to this lecture ok. The alchemy of English is that it is both a it has its vehicular load ok and at the same time it also encourages hybrid forms. We look at you know the need for instance all, the, all this while we talk about that there is a need okay, for uh, you know um, for various purposes particularly in, in, in uh, you know in academia in Wolfora for instance. Now, let us look at what Tom MacArthur, Tom MacArthur is a well known name in the study you know in the field of international English and uh, he has uh, in the, the Oxford guide to world English he refers to these particular uh, you know. Uh, areas where this kind uh, an international English is sought to be devised. So, he says though world English is varied certain varieties and registers are fairly tightly controlled. Okay. So, you cannot make you cannot be creative there right. You cannot uh, you know use you they are very very tightly constrained okay. very tightly constrained. Uh, uh, you know as far as the use of words is concerned uh, without which they also could be dangerous situations right. For instance, uh, airports for instance look at this term is it refers to airports. Now, you cannot get creative in a, in a situation which is so tightly circumscribed by rules by schedules okay, uh, by terminologies. Okay. So, there are certain um, you know niches or certain areas where you you 
have to abide by a certain standardized English. So, the world English is varied, certain varieties and registers are fairly tightly controlled, often through standardized, this is important, patterns of use. So, international English is not just a matter only of world fora, but also in very, you know, in very pragmatic situations, for instance, says thus there is a marked uniformity. There has to be a marked uniformity, particularly say in the following areas, airports, in the broadcast media. Okay. Communication cannot be garbled here, communication cannot be vague here in the broadcast media. Okay. In newspapers and periodicals and in computer use, email and the internet web. Now, so you see that MacArthur here is again uh, enlarging the scope okay, of using uniform, uh, uh, uniform, uh, uniform uh, an English with uniformity or language with uniformity and some of the areas as we found are airports, newspapers and periodicals in the broadcast media and in computer use, email and the internet web, okay, which strengthens again you know this call for a uniform English. Now, I will point to another essay which is by Marco Modiano, another well known name international English in the global village. Now, let us see what Modiano has to say about international English. As English takes on the responsibilities of a lingua franca non-native speakers are taking a more active role in the development of English. This was a point that was made a while ago, I think um, by one of the scholars that we, uh, you know, we, we talked about. Okay? So, as English takes on the responsibilities of a common uh, uh, world language, the non-native speaker is also taking a more active role in the development of the language. <coughs> Excuse me, not only in respect to the manner in which they develop educational models for the teaching of local varieties, but this is important also in their understanding of how the language is used in cross cultural communication. And there is more communication in the world among peoples. Okay. There has to be an alertness in how you devise a language for intercultural communication. Understandably, when observing the language as it is used internationally, they experience a great deal of multiplicity not only in pronunciation and vocabulary, but also in other respects. This indicates as I see it that in the teaching of English as an international language, in emphasis should be placed on a descriptive as opposed to a prescriptive model. We find another, now again another aspect or another side of the problem if you may call it, been brought about by Modiano. All this while we have looked at scholars who you know have said that yes there is there should be an almost prescriptive you know international english because they cannot be you cannot have variations in say in in, in international fora in as, as mentions here in the computer uh, um, the, 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 the digital world or in airports etc in public places how can you have you know different varieties of english modiano here in fact says that the moment the non native speaker okay takes on an important uh, role in not just as he says in not just developing educational models for teaching English in their non native uh, English speaking communities, but also also in you know uh, putting in their part in the cross cultural communication of English. So, this is an important point I think that Modiano makes here is that you cannot as far as long as a non native speaker is involved okay, and will be involved in the creation of uh, the English language, you can no longer go by the prescriptive model. Okay. So, you have to enlarge the scope, you have to have a descriptive model. Okay. Perhaps even you cannot have like you have world Englishes today, perhaps you cannot have international English you got to have international Englishes, this is just my way of you know talking about it. You perhaps need to have international Englishes, you perhaps need to understand that this says that there are there will be okay, there will be a descriptive model that is far more important than one uh, you know one standard form of international English. So, like in world Englishes, 
variety is also another important aspect that is coming in into the international uh, English. International English has had uh, you know several uh, there have been several attempts at international at, at an international and international English. Why has it ha have those attempts failed? Okay? Perhaps as uh, Modiano tells us that we have always uh, you know gone by the prescriptive model or the linear model. We have not looked at the fact that you have to have a descriptive model and perhaps at different kinds it may sound paradoxical, okay, but at different kinds and varieties of international English. I will refer to again Nigel Ross uh, uh, and what he has to say in his essay signs of international English. Now, Ross says that international English may simply refer to the varieties of English spoken in different parts of the world. Alternatively, international English may designate a form of English which though not actually spoken by anyone provides what he calls the common core. First, what does Ross say? Ross says it's international English in the, in the same vein as we saw ago. International English may refer to the varieties of English spoken in different parts of the world, but also it may refer to a common core, okay, a common core to all the world's varieties of English. More usually, however, the expression indicates the kind of English used by native and or non-native speakers of English as a lingua franca for communicating basic information. Okay? Now, this is, a, this is a point that is important here, conveying not all kinds of information. Now, probably you can say that for those kinds of information, you may have a descriptive model or you may have, uh, you know, uh, you may be acquainted with, um, you know, English that is colored, so to speak, has different hues given by non-native speakers. But he says that this common core, going again, going by the you know more traditionalist mode of uh, looking at international English, this common core is to do what is to give basic information in a simple manner. Okay, so a lingua franca for communicating basic information in a simple manner often in the business environment, but also in international airports, popular tourist resorts and so on. Though hardly so simple, and he agrees that this is not as so simple as it may look like. However, international English can also describe the English used by groups of people again such as the scientific community at an international level. Okay? So, we find that while Nigel Ross tells us about you know um, about the fact that in international English may refer to different varieties of English, he on uh, as a scholar prefers to go by the traditionalist model okay, of English for basic you know with a basic uh, uh, vocabulary and a basic to, to convey basic information and in a simple manner. Fine. So, um, let us look uh, you know let us do a recap by way of discussion and uh, for instance what are the questions that we may get in you know. Uh, uh, in a paper on in international English on in a very elementary level. So, one of the questions you may get is how do you define international English. Okay? So, you may use quotations from any of the scholars given here, but as a basic definition you may also talk uh, or define international English as um, a kind of English which has as its goal. Okay? Uh, which has as its goal the uh, you know the communication of English in an international setup. Okay? And then you may go on to say that this is used usually in world fora of business, okay, academics, policy making, etcetera. Right? Another question that you may get is how what is the difference between world English and international English? So, world English say that world English and international English um, differs in a very important way, okay, which is that whereas world English or world Englishes talks about and insists sometimes on the varieties of English okay, spoken developed and spoken in different parts of the world including the non native uh, you know English speaking world. International English is an attempt at devising a core English okay, which can be used by people all over the world without okay, their non-native specificities okay, in order for a smooth 
basic as I said basic information of transfer at the international or world level. Okay. Then you another question you may got uh, you may get is uh, international English is known by several different names and what are those names? And you say that these are ELF or English as a lingua franca, common English sorry continental English, basic English, global English etcetera. Then um, what uh, finally you may get a question like what are the you know uh, what are the complexities or what are the uh, what are the inherent difficulties in devising uh, international English or for what are the subtleties in talking about international English. So, one of the things uh, that you may say is the increasing role of the non native speaker. Okay. The increasing role as somebody has pointed out here uh, Barbara Seidhofer I think the increasing role of the non native speaker means two things at the same time means a that the non native speaker is going to take uh, an important increasingly important part in developing uh, English as uh, or in developing international in English, but at the same time okay, the uh, the local varieties of English of the non native speaker may also be incorporated. So, we have this as I said the, this Yanner's face or two sided problem okay. on the one hand you there is um, uh, there is um, clearly a goal of, uh, uh, of uh, um, developing a language which is a lingua franca and on the other hand you also have the English language almost paradoxically um, helping in in uh, the manifestation of cultural identities. Uh, therefore, one scholar has said that you will always remain with this problem. The earlier traditionalist way of looking at English language and attempts at, at uh, devising international English as an international language have followed the prescriptive models okay, of the uh, uh, followed these um, uh, um, you know the single uh, uh, you know core Anglo American usage of words which will then form a repertoire a collection of words to be used in various international uh, situations. But we need to look more at a descriptive we, uh, we, we have to adopt a more descriptive orientation okay, not follow the prescriptive ones right. So, giving again bringing full circle we began by talking about world Englishes as different and international English as being uh, you know um, um, as, as relinquishing difference. So, it seems like now you have to follow a middle path sort of where international English is uh, also probably going towards international Englishes not perhaps in the world Englishes manner, but where non native elements are also to be incorporated. Okay. So, where the model becomes a descriptive one and not a prescriptive one. I think at this point of time as we speak a lot is you know going to happen in the future as far as EIL is concerned okay. and in to looking at the literature here which this, this uh, essay was concerned more at several others which I do not have to have time to talk about now. In this lecture we lo looked at various you know inputs by scholars of international English and what they had to say. Okay. So, we found that uh, it may go the world English way, okay, world English's way of having several international Englishes okay, or uh, Englishes for international as used as an international language where one has to adapt oneself okay, and learn the different international Englishes for different parts of the world. So, this is just one way where it may go or if you like it may also uh, another important uh, I think uh, um, diagnosis here may be that uh, like for, for instance having when there was this attempt at Esperanto okay, or the world uh, a world language for everyone which died down. Uh, probably in uh, English for uh, as an international language may also see that there are uh, that that the attempts at formulating an English uh, variant for international language may even cease. Okay, if it goes the way of Esperanto or, or a world language, it may it may indeed fail. But it is important for us in us in us in our uh, you know under uh, you know in our greater understanding of the English language 
to take into consideration also this attempt that has been made and as I said we do not know th where this I mean they go, go, go both ways they may, may, may com completely give up relinquish the idea of an international English and get to learn varieties of English or depending on uh, you know depending on uh, uh, the, the world economic scenario okay, and most Im important uh, importantly the increasing use of the internet where also might which also might help again in the resurfacing of an attempt to make international English okay, or English as an international language. So, let me stop here and leave you with uh, this this really is open end one of the most open ended I think we do not have a conclusion here we do not have a solution here all that remains is for us to watch and see. Thank you.